This episode is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements, the leader in digestive health for dogs, cats, and horses. Hello and welcome to Chats with the Chatfield. This is a podcast to expand your idea of what impacts veterinarians, pet owners, and basically all animal lovers in the galaxy as humans. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen Nevet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And if you have not yet subscribed to our show, why not? Just go to chatfieldshow.com and subscribe today. And if you want to reach us, you can find me with any message full of love and positivity at jen at chatfieldshow.com. And as always, if you have any serious questions or concerns with real life issues, you can reach me at jason at chatfieldshow.com. Okay. Well, welcome into the chat room, um, everybody. Today, we have a great show ahead of us. Uh, we have a returner. Yep. A return. Okay. Jason, that was a not returner? the best reaction. A returner to the oh, chat room. Oh, I didn't know. I'm not even sure that's a word, but okay. <laughs> it is today. Uh, so, works in Scrabble. We have Dr. Renee Schmidt coming back into the chat room. Um, I know. I'm very excited because we listened to Chatterboxes. You guys loved her when she came on before, and we loved her, and we're so impressed with how smart she is um, that we asked her back, and somehow she said yes. So it's very exciting. So as a brief reminder, refresher for everybody, what makes Dr. Renee so amazing, uh, besides just being a wonderful person, is that she is uh, what we call double boarded. So she is board certified in veterinary toxicology, but she's also um, a diplomate, as we say, of the American Board of Toxicology. And what? yeah, do you know the difference between those two, Jason? I don't, actually. Yeah. Uh, American Explain it board, for us that doesn't know. American Board of Toxicology does not discriminate. It's just all toxins it, all the uh, time. Wow. That's a much broader umbrella. All right. It is. Veterinary it toxicology is. by itself is pretty impressive, but toxicology is that's it. Okay, then. That's right. I'm going to so, sit, sit back and learn stuff like normal. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Renee. Welcome back into the chat room. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, that's wonderful. And we should, we should mention actually, um, as well that she is, um, a big bomb diggity at the pet poison helpline and at safety call international. So if you call there panicking because your dog, cat, bird, uh, I guess board of toxicology, anything, anything yeah. <laughs> any creature that you love may have come into contact with something that, that you don't know is toxic or not. You may get Dr. Renee on the phone. Um, right. yeah, or so you can just simply ask for the big bomb diggity and no, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a red line right to her. They right? won't know who that is. Uh, the BBD phone is ringing again. Oh my gosh. Better answer it. Oh, yes. Yes, Dr. Renee. Okay. So, um, that's fantastic. And we do love what you do. We'll talk a little bit more about what she does over there. Um, in a, in a second, we'll get to that. But today, hold on. I'm going to refocus my camera, everybody. I was going to say, I, you're out of focus. I was As out of per focus. the norm, you're out of focus. Yes. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to focus on like mm -hmm. things that you should not have in your yard if you have a pet. That's a great topic, right? It sounds weird, things you shouldn't have in your yard. But I mean, almost everyone that has, especially dogs, has a yard. They plant stuff. And and some good conscious owners think, gosh, should I plant this or not? Because I think I think we're going to be surprised the amount of things that are actually or can be toxic to your animals, right? Yeah. And it's not just yep. stuff you can plant because- what? Yeah. Okay. It's just gonna be it's just gonna be stuff that could be in like the yardish arena. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. I was yeah. like okay. And, I right. wasn't sure where you're going with that, but all right. And li and listen up, everyone with apartments, it's still you, right? Because even if you don't have an apartment, <laughs> that's right. Like I mean, I feel like every human has this innate need for like a potted plant. Like you're gonna have a plant somewhere. Right. Um okay. And or take your dog's garden. places. Yeah. Don't get the patio garden. The so patio the garden. Thank you so much. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, shall we hit it? Shall we just let's get started? It. No, I'm ready. Okay. So let's start. Number one. So, and and Dr. Renee, you could, you could <laughs> share these with us. Like I've got notepad and paper. You feel free to share these with us in any order that you like. Which one is like your favorite if you want to start with that or your least favorite or... Just however you want to kick it off. Yeah. So I think we'll start out with the the one plant that I would avoid 
kind of at all costs. Um, if you have a pet, if you have a dog or a cat, okay. and those are the sago palms. Oh, so oh. you guys oh. in, in Florida, the warm weather, and we used to think of it just as a warm season plant because yes. it's the palm outside, yep. but they're making little hybrids, little miniature dwarfs that you can have in your house. Like a bonsai sago. sago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like and a, so a, you can uh, get them in the colder climates, um, climates all over the, all over the country and even Canada. Uh, we see we get calls from them too from having them inside so that's probably my that's probably my number one plant to always avoid i won't tell you this but i'm going to tell you anyway dr jen nevette has 47 sago palms in her yard that she's going to have to go dig up right now i know well here's the thing here's the thing um because we have so many sagos this is one that i am familiar with but also as a practitioner, I've seen dogs that came in, they came in and they were, they were vomity and they didn't feel good. And, uh, I just looked at them and I was like, yeah, did they eat anything? And the owners did not realize that that dog had eaten a sago palm. Um, the, not the pup, but, um, like the seed, like the seed. Yeah. Is and this, they the chewed it. a bad thing or what? It's real yeah. bad. It's real yeah. bad. So we did I'm trying to picture a dog chewing on the bark, and I'm like, I don't know what dog's going to chew on that, but maybe they are. I I didn't want to call any species out. (laughs) I'm just trying to give everyone a benefit of the doubt here. But but is is the bark actually, or I don't know if these are considered bark, but is the the trunk of the sago uh, toxic as well? Yeah, you bet. So all parts of that plant are toxic. The um, the seeds are definitely the most toxic parts. But you know, even the what are they, the fronds, yeah. the, the the leaves, the leaves. The that, those are all all of it. All of it is toxic. And the downside to the seeds is that you know they they drop. Um, right. They drop occasionally or a lot and mm-hmm. very frequently. And so the owner may not see them in the yard, and they may not know that they're out there. May not even think about it. Sure. Yeah. And then these dogs get into it and we can see liver failure. We can see some neurologic signs, so seizures developing, some really severe gastrointestinal, so vomiting and diarrhea with blood uh, yeah. really can be uh, fatal to these guys. So it's yeah. just a big, it, I don't live in a warm climate, but it'd be a no, it'd be a no in my yard for sure. If they, yeah. if they do for sure, like, like Dr. Jin said, know that they, like she thought, oh, they get into something. If they know for sure they got into a Sago mm-hmm. seed and they said, hey, one seed, and it was this big and it was, you know, they are 25, big. That's, but that's the 35 thing. They look minutes like little ago. Balls. They look like little balls. Right. They're perfect for them to swallow and chew up. Is there anything that, that, that can be done or is this just a, you know, palliative care and, you know, empty the stomach and, and cross your fingers and hope there's no anti Sago uh anti-venom antidote. or whatever An- yeah. antidote antidote it's not, it's not yeah, like a snake yeah. There, there's no true antidote you're right and what so what we would do is we would do decontamination like you said we would right. try to get them to vomit see if we could get it out um you can use activated charcoal in some of these cases they've actually started um having some fairly decent reports and good responses with using cholestyramine instead of activated mm-hmm. charcoal and so we're using that as well and then there's some uh, medications called N-acetylcysteine that is, um, is, it helps with liver supports and really yep. just trying to help prevent signs from developing and issues right. from occurring. Okay. But yeah, unfortunately, there's no, no reversal. Yeah, that was my point. Right, I was but, trying to bring up, don't plant the plant. There's nothing, you know. Right, well, but, yeah. but I'll tell you, um, so the handful of sago palm toxicities that I know for a fact were that, because sometimes we don't ever know, right, with the dog ate. Right. The ones that I knew that were that, most of them, they, they had either chewed extensively on the seed or they had chewed and eaten the seed. Oh. Um, and I did, but it was it was so long that I couldn't make them upchuck the seed itself because it they digested whatever is there right i mean i you know they'd bark their guts out at home and they didn't come up but um using uh, activated charcoal um to absorb whatever remained in the gut uh because that's an important piece that owners sometimes discount um is absorbing whatever's still there um and then i have used um the uh coli um cholestyramine coli calcium mm-hmm. whichever that is i can't remember cholestyramine. cholestyramine yeah um as well in toxicity cases only in blue green algae toxicity though i didn't use it in sago but anyhow 
I would We're use talking that. about Sago, Dr. J. And then, and then I flushed them, right? Because dilution is the solution to all pollution, right? right? So I put them on aggressive IV fluids. I put them on liver support, you know, milk thistle and all the liver protectants that we have, um, stop the puking. And I actually had great success with those with those dogs. Some had to stay on the, in hospital and on IV supportive care longer than others, but they did, they did well, even though their, oh my Lord, their blood work looked horrific. I mean, horrifically bad blood work. I was giving the guarded prognosis conversation with the owner just to let them know it was bad, but. So your um, moral of the story is what Dr. Jen? Is you know, if they, if they accidentally ingest it, don't give up, be aggressive. Up. Be yeah. aggressive yeah. At the, and that was oh. the other thing is at the beginning, they were aggressive and whatever, but it, here's the key part. I only had one of those owners that even knew what a Sago Palm was. The others were I like, think, what, what's a Sago yeah, Palm? This is the moral people, people, they're, they're pretty plants to show at Home Depot or wherever people love them. They're interesting looking plants, but you just got to be aware part, part of your job is as a steward, you know, of the, of the pet's life is to know what's good and what's bad for yes. them. So we're trying to get the, the news out there, the information, we're putting it out there for you folks. That's yeah. right. That's right. For we sure. Are. Yeah. We are. And when they, and when they do get into something, you know, just don't, don't dismiss it, you know, yeah. just right away, contact your veterinarian or, just or some other, animal, you know, the animal or poison, pet poison. Yeah. Pet poison helpline. We're here 24 seven. So, you yes. know, when your veterinarian isn't there, but yeah. And the one other comment I would make about your charcoal too, just for pet owners to know is that a lot of times they think that, oh, I'll just go get those capsules, those charcoal capsules mm -hmm. over the counter. Not the same thing, not no. the same amount, not the same grade, not the same um, effect. Uh, effect. Yeah, for sure. So, so uh, especially with Sago Palm, don't self-treat. No, you're, because you're, it's gonna, it's not gonna go well, and you're gonna be upset later. So uh -huh. yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's a great one to start off with. Uh, so right now we're gonna take a short break. So put your earbuds in and go check your yard for sago palms, because right. also, um, like our guest and Dr. Jason don't know it, but I bet you that our producer dropped a photo of some sago palms <laughs> on oh, the video. Well, and that's a good thing. That's what they look like. It People would not even know, right? It is. Oh. So um, so if you're listening to the audio version, check it on the YouTube channel because we're going to put the pictures up of all of these things that Dr. Renee is going to share with us. All right. So quick break. We're going to be right back. Hang out so you can find out Dr. Renee's other tips for safe landscaping. It's Dr. Jen the vet, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Keith Latson. He's got an incredibly interesting story all about Full Bucket Health. My college roommate and vet school housemate, Dr. Rob Franklin and I were collaborating on some cases. Both of us were struggling with diarrhea in some of our patients, whether it was after a procedure or after, after an illness. So we created a formulation, but we didn't want to just create a formulation. We also wanted to create a movement in animal health for being able to help animals in need through the use of our products that we develop. That really has resulted in our one-for-one -one giving program, which we're re really proud of, as much as we are our formulations for dogs, horses, and cats. And so if you wanna know more about their one-for-one -one giving at Full Bucket, or if you're interested in better supporting your dog, cat, or horse's digestive health, head over to fullbuckethealth.com to learn more. All right, and we're back in the chat room. Dr. Chase is talking about redactions, right? Dr. Renee said, is talking about any, toxins. Anytime we use Dr. Jen the vet's name, we got to redact it for, for to keep the reputation of the paper up. That's all I was saying. That's True. it. And that's a that's a normal thing to say. So that's so. I mean, no, I'm normal. sorry, it's not normal. I'm just not kidding. normal. Okay. Um, anyway, all right. So Sago Palms, they're a big no-no. Okay, everyone, I know you ran out and checked your um. Your, your yard right now and your neighbor's yard because those those things can can travel right those little those seeds can fall over and fall birds, into your driveway yeah. oh yeah would it have to be a big big, big bird. bird stop it it could be a bird <laughs> could be a bird i don't know maybe it's a baby hawk thinking it's a mouse or something oh, really? no, i don't want that okay Tough all happens. right <clears throat> okay all right yeah so that's our first one so say go palm so now what what's next what what all else right. do we have to look out for so I'm going to shift gears just a little bit to your garden. 
So it can okay. be in your little, your little balcony garden or your little garden in the yard. A lot of people like to plant chives and onions. Uh, yes. And so sure. I would say to um, not necessarily avoid them, but make sure they're probably have some little fencing around them for your oh, okay. cats, especially. So dogs and cats are both tox um, are, are both sensitive to onions and garlic, any type of onions. So the chives, scallions, anything like that. And so cats are, are really more sensitive. And my cats love to nibble on whatever we garden. Yeah, and they so love it. We, yeah. So we had to put a little fence around the guard uh, around that area to mm -hmm. keep them off of it. They can have um, anemia, so they can destroy their red blood cells. And if it's one of those things that a lot of times people don't notice that their that their pet got into it, and if they get into enough, then they can just you know the veterinarian will they'll tell the veterinarian gosh they're kind of lethargic they're dumpy they're not eating they're not really have really clear signs and then they may be anemic which can be caused by many different things mm -hmm. so onions uh onions chives anything like that that make sure you've got fencing around or just avoid that in your garden okay so i have a question about that too because <clears throat> cosette you know cosette actually dr renee has met cosette in person Yes. Um, so she loves her too, but, uh, I'm just presuming, um, <laughs> Cosette loves to, um, clean up whatever I don't at supper. And, and, you know, we always learned about, um, onions and garlic and my favorite flavoring is garlic and onions. And so when, whenever I cook with that, I like, I don't let her, I'm sorry, the plate sorry. or anything. When it Whenever you what was that? Yeah, word? I cook. I cook. <laughs> oh, I don't think Come so. On. Okay. Whenever you reheat some food with that, anyways, go ahead. Anyway, All so right. but then I feel like um, you know, it's a little bit of an old wives' tale, and I'm not sure. I mean, I err on the side of, yeah, she doesn't need it. Okay, but um, but is that true? Is that the same thing you're talking about with like the raw onion and chives and scallions and garlic and stuff, or is cooked different? Or what's the deal? Yeah, you bring up a really good point. And sometimes the cooked is worse because if you're using like garlic powder, onion powder, oh, yeah. they're so much more concentrated or yeah. the dried minced onions. They're so oh. much more concentrated than using a like a full onion. And okay. so that can actually be somewhat more problematic once you've mixed it in with your meal unless they're eating the entire plate of what it is, <laughs> probably not going to be as big of an issue. Okay. But um, when they, when you leave that sitting out on the counter, they, they get into the container. Uh, we had a dog this uh, past year that's ingested a, a large amount of garlic powder from a Costco one of those big, large oh containers and, wow. and had severe signs and you know, it was wow. really ill for several days. So wow. That's probably uh, inside the home. That's probably the bigger concern. Definitely mm -hmm. with those cooked things is the concentrated products. Concentrate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. Um, but I mean, really, because also people worry about that if the dog gets a little bit off a plate. Um, so if it's, it's kind of diluted again, dilution that's with right. um, the food items that you cooked it with. And it's not just like a plate of onion or garlic um, then it's okay. But either way, I'm just, it's cause that still doesn't need that. Like she right. doesn't need it. She doesn't need that so bad that it's worth a risk. I would say. But I think growing them in the garden is probably uh, not uncommon. People love yep. to grow those things because they feel very organic and I'm not going to buy it at the store. I'm going to snip, snip, snip and use those in my, and then yeah. meanwhile, your cat's chowing down on them, you know, all during the day. So yeah, you know, that's... just know that they're not great. A lot of people probably don't, don't recognize that these things aren't, aren't uh, great for them. So put a fence up. I love it. Yeah. All natural doesn't mean it's all okay. Yeah. That's right? a very right. good point. Okay. Okay. I like that one. All right. So say go palms chives okay. scallions onions garlic okay right. what's next uh let's go back to plants because we're bouncing today so lilies uh let's oh, yeah. do lilies lilies for cats and i just feel like we can never talk about it enough and it's amazing how many veterinarians uh, don't remember or, or even just veterinary staff don't remember that lilies are necessarily bad or which type of lilies yeah. and pet owners too you know it's just it's something that we just don't think about and so the Hemerocallis lily, so day lilies, who doesn't love a day lily out right. in their They're gorgeous, right? Um, really common for right. landscaping. Yeah. We have them in our in in our area. Fortunately, we had cats that didn't really like to chew on on those plants, 
-hmm. But now we have a kitten who will eat anything. And so we're going to end up likely having to dig up those, uh, wow. those, yeah. those lilies before it warms up yeah. again, but we can see kidney failure develop. So Lilium, the genus Lilium, so Oriental Lily, Stargazers, Tiger Lilies, Rose what? Lilies. Those are all the pretty ones. What are you I talking know. about? Those are the pretty yeah, ones. Those are the pretty ones. But if you have cats that go outside, if you have cats that go outside and roam and like yeah. to chew on plant material, those are really a bad, uh, a bad option. Yeah. yeah. And I guess the treatment for those would be the same, would be try to you know, give activated charcoal or some sort of toxic absorbent into the gut and then um, just put them on aggressive like IV fluid care, supportive care and kind of wait for it to pass through the system. Would that be yeah. correct? Yeah, you got it. So trying to vomit, uh, trying to get the cat to vomit. There's no safe way to get your cat to vomit at home. So please don't try. They need to go into the veterinarian activated charcoal, like you said, and then IV fluids, because we can see kidney failure, yeah. we're not really preventing the toxin. As far as the IV fluids go, we're really trying to do it for support to support yeah. for the kidneys and to protect the kidney. Yeah. And these, um, a lot of these guys, they do really well. Fortunately with aggressive care, it would be uncommon for them to actually develop kidney failure. Oh, wow. The downside is that if you don't treat them and you just wait and see, it can be too late. Oh, okay. So definitely treating. Um, do you guys get a lot of calls at the, um, the pet poison line for lilies? Or... Yeah. One of our really? most common. Yeah. It's really? probably, I want to say it's probably in our top five or six for sure in our top 10. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Cause I'm used to seeing like, especially around Easter, you know, because lilies are Easter lilies and I'm, I'm just see, I feel like we get flooded with social media posts and you know just like psa information right yeah, yeah saying yeah, like yeah. hey hey people don't forget lilies are toxic but i guess maybe it is something people forget or it just doesn't occur to them and, or they have yeah. other lilies besides the the, the, the calla lilies yeah. or whatever the easter lilies are they have yeah. the tiger ones or whatever in the bouquets and they fall and they dry and i'm sure they're really dangerous when they dry and all this other kind of stuff so. yeah 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 and they think gosh my cat's not going to get into it you know my cat never yeah. gets up yeah. on the table it's not going to get into yeah. it or they're, they're getting flowers to feel better. And so they're not really thinking mm. about uh, right. their pet you know, at that time, or it's a celebration or something like that. And so yeah. they've, they've just got other things on their mind. And, and that, you know, a lot of times that cat that is so good and never gets on anything. And then all of a sudden, look at this beautiful bouquet. This looks really appetizing. Let me right. test right. it out. Right. And it's new. And, but like you said, also, I do think, um, in the spring kitten season, right. Um, people who maybe have had a, a pretty stable feline population in their house, the one cat or two cats they've had that are grown ups, and then they get a kitten and yeah. they, they forget like how fun kittens can be. <laughs> They're super fun. Yeah. Is, that true? Is that true? Dr. Renee? <laughs> yes. They've been so fun. You forget about, um, you know, you, I used to be able to set things on the kitchen counter or the kitchen table. And then you turn around and, oh, there's a cat up there now. Yeah, we've had to kitten proof our homes. So uh, yeah, that's we're, true. we're in the same boat as, as every other pet owner out there. I love that. I love that. Okay. All right. So we got lilies. So what's up next? I'm waiting. There's one specific one. I'm waiting to see if it makes your list. <laughs> Is it a plant? It's a plant. It's not a, it's not a rare plant. It's a common plant. So I think I would say <laughs> rhododendrons and azaleas are questionable. Oh, oh questionable. that's a good one. And the, the reason I say that is because honestly, I probably would keep them in my yard if I had dogs and cats because they don't, they really need to ingest a large amount for it, but uh, um, they have uh, heart toxins, cardiotoxins that are yep. in there. And so they can cause... Uh, blood pressure and heart rate and heart rhythm problems and can be really problematic. Yeah. Usually they have to, you know, it's more than ingesting, nibbling just a little leaf or so it's, it's getting into a little bit more than that. The mm -hmm. downside with trying to say uh, with chocolate, we can say this much chocolate they have to get into. And it's hard to yeah. determine that in plants because it's hard to really quantify how much they get into. Yeah. And, yeah. but I would probably, I, I'd be cautious with that if I had a pet that really loved to eat um, plant material. Yeah. Non-food items. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 
That, you bring up a good point. I was going to ask uh, that exact question about, listen, if I say my cat took one little lick of a cow lily, would you worry? Would I mean, how do you handle that versus versus my cat? Well, I just dug up all these lilies. Do you treat them the same because you just don't don't know the actual concentration uh, of toxins in the plant or actually how much the animal got? Or do you sort of kind of wait and see at that point? I think that's a tough a tough thing. You're right with chocolate. Yeah. Hey, the whole bag. If you get in here, ah, one, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Just watch. Keep an eye on it. But with plants, you know, what's how do you how, how do you, do you estimate that? that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That can be the frustrating part oh. of treating plants because we have to look to see if the owner can can determine. Well, how much of that leaf is missing? How much of you know did they? Sometimes they'll come in and say, "Gosh, the whole plant was destroyed," and you know, there's there's pieces of the plant all over the place and there's parts missing, then we're going to get pretty aggressive. If they are able to say, gosh, I can tell that that a tiny little pea is is on there, you know, pea size is missing, then we'll then we'll kind of go from there and maybe be a little bit less aggressive. If they licked it, but they didn't ingest the whole actual plant material itself, probably will be pretty fairly um, conservative and maybe just monitor those. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that's- like I had a little piece of lily there myself. I everybody everything just stopped there for a second. But I'm back. Don't worry about it. I'm back, baby. All right. Okay. So I do love that you brought up the um rhododendrons because they're one of my favorite plants to talk about. Uh because also, um, you know, we, we sometimes talk about honeybee medicine in the chat room. <laughs> and you know that that's a fun one. <laughs> if you feed if you feed bees. Um, uh, if you have those flowers from rhododendrons available, then you get the, you know, the, the magic honey, the funny honey, um, that has hallucinogens in it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, um, so rhododendrons can be, I guess, you know, just hours of fun, whether you have bees <laughs> or, or, or pets, but still I would recommend not having them in your yard. <laughs> I'm going to have um, to look up what rhododendron is. I know. No, you better put a picture on there. That's me. right. You All just right, look good. on our YouTube with the YouTube they're show. They're pretty. They are. They're pretty plants, and they're they're still that warm weather plants a little bit yeah. more. But uh, in the house, you can definitely buy them to have a as a as a house plant too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, so we got one more slot here, maybe for the top five, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I what got an got? idea. What I got an idea. What Doctor Jen's thinking about? I have an idea. All right, but we're gonna put the we're gonna put the pressure squarely on your on shoulders. the guest. <laughs> I'm gonna say, and I'm and I'm thinking of most toxic here or most concerning. Oh. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking what I'm we gonna, have in the yard. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> say yew plants, like Japanese yews. Oh. Is that on your list? That was not, not, but that's a good one though, because people forget it. It's all fun and games until a Japanese you shows up in your list. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. And they're common, you know, they're, they they're a common they plant. Common. We have them. We yeah. have them in our, in our, um, landscaping as well. Oh, wow. and we finally, we kind of finally took them down because animals like to eat the berries and they the, the um even though the the leaves or the stems from them are, are kind of scratchy and they dogs will eat anything they and are. so i those also cause heart issues yep. so they have um, what we call cardiotoxins that are in that as well and they have to eat a decent amount of them but certainly uh, enough of a concern especially if they're ingesting the berries that are from there which are probably i would say the most appealing to the dog because yeah. they they're soft and fluffy Right. And they seem like Pro- a toy. Probably I mean, colorful. Yeah. 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 Well, um, there were two, there were actually, there were two things that, uh, that popped course. in my head. Right. So one was oleander. Um, okay. Yeah. Because it's, because it is so like, it's fairly ubiquitous um, in a lot of the United States, but oh. I, well, people don't usually like in my, in my experience, which is probably going to be very, very small compared to yours, Dr. Renee. I don't like, even when I used to work in emergency clinics, I didn't get a lot of people whose dogs ate oleander or cat ate oleander. I don't know if it's just too large of a bush or, but they, I just didn't, it's, we just know that it's toxic. Right. So I thought oleander was a big concern for horses. Is that, is that a thing or am I kind of making that up? Is that totally a. So it's definitely a bigger concern for the larger animals or grazing animals, but Mm -hmm. definitely something you can see in dogs and cats, but you're right, um, Dr. Jen, it's not something we get a ton of calls on. The state that has the most calls with oleanders, Arizona. Arizona happens to be a oleander state. 
And um, I think why I remember that I'm not sure, but <laughs> they were the ones on this last year. Uh, yeah. We had the most oleander calls from Arizona. But and you know, I wonder if that's because the plant itself, it's, I don't think it's a succulent, but, um, but I think it doesn't require like a ton of water, right? Yeah. I don't think that it does. And it's, again, it's a warm weather, warm season plant. So we see yeah. it more in the Southern, Southern regions. And I don't yeah. know, I guess maybe you could have it as an indoor plant. I guess that's not one that I think of as someone having as an indoor plant. Me so maybe either. that's why we don't get a lot of calls on yeah. the indoor. Yeah, me either. Me either. Um, yeah. And then the other one that was in my head was um, my first puppy that I had, uh, my once in a lifetime dog, Daisy, best dog ever. Um, she as a puppy. Oh. Uh, and also this was when I was in school, right. In vet school. And like, you know, everything like, you know, when you learn a new disease as a vet student, you're like, Oh my God, I think my dog has it. Yeah. Oh my God. My, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we were, um, I must've been in toxicology at some point with her and um, they talked about Diffenbachia um yeah. plants like dumb king. yeah yeah and i and i had one of those in my little duplex apartment and of course naturally daisy decided to investigate it and i was like oh my god i've broken my dog yeah <laughs> That's a med student so i think of that one i think that one's not as common anymore i would guess um you know what it is actually common but it's not a big concern so they can chew on the leaves and the plants and they can really kind of go to town on it. And they have what are called insoluble oxalate crystals in the leaves and in the uh -huh. plant material. And so what makes that problematic is that it causes irritation to the mouth and maybe to the stomach, but it isn't going to cause what we call systemic. So it's not going to cause right. organ damage. And we don't, we don't do anything with those. We yeah. rinse out the mouth, wipe it out if you can, just to get all some of those little crystals out. It's kind of yeah. fun. They're called little raphides and idioblasts. And like, there's these little crystals that they sit in a pillow. And then when the animal chews on it, it pops out of those little pillows and it gets in their mouth. So it's, wow. it's kind of fun to talk about and to see them, but it not, a big, not a big concern. Yeah. Well, Daisy was fine. Everyone, she lived a long life. <laughs> <laughs> after but I, I would imagine that probably tastes bad and they don't like it so it's probably a little self-regulation yeah yeah there's usually some pain that comes along with it so a lot of times the Sounds owners like will say gosh they're drooling really bad they're pawing at their mouth and rubbing and yeah she and drooled. so yeah. yeah yeah jason which one were you thinking so, of? so i had i i spent a lot of time in southern 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 florida right <laughs> and they can grow everything there good bad whatever everything grows because the weather's so great it's like people grow there it's yeah. like ridiculous but everything is so good because the weather's so good um but there's a lot of really pretty plants they use in hedges and i forget if they're datura or trumpet plants or angel plants oh, whatever yeah they're, they're angel real trumpets. pretty angel trumpet plants they are really really gorgeous and they're they're all over down there yes. uh and i'm fairly certain they're toxic i just don't know if you get a lot of calls you probably don't because they're typically outdoor plants but who knows maybe they fall in the eating because i know it's the inside of the flower i believe that's mm -hmm. the most the most toxic and to humans anyways or maybe it just causes you know hallucinogen i mean it's hallucinogenic and maybe it's not necessarily toxic i don't know who knows but i, yeah. I like them you you bring up a good one. I I remember that one being yes. a, more Point of a concern with, <laughs> more of a concern with um with your cattle, your grazing animals, your cattle yeah. and things like that. But um, I, I'm sure there's probably a potential issue of it with small animals. But you're right; it's really if they get a hold of it. But I think it's probably harder for them to get a yeah, hold. Yeah, I just I wanted to bring it up because they're pretty. That's all. They're really yeah. pretty plants. All the pretty plants are bad for you. It's crazy. They are. They yeah. are. And they're in yeah. the southern region. The pretty yeah. uh, the no. prettiest. I don't know That's, if it's pretty, but they grow everything there. That's for sure. They do grow everything down there. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's um one thing that uh and I friends, I did not warn Dr. Renee that I was gonna ask her about this, but it comes up all the time and it's it's sort of plant related, I guess, uh, because it's in the yard. Um, and I saw it a lot in emergency. Um bufo toads, toads. Mm right? So because if you have landscaping and especially if you have a watering system and you make it wet, um, then you, you're likely to find all kinds of creatures there. Um, and I, I don't know a ton about different snails, but I think there's some snails that can be toxic. Um, but I know the toads are. 
Yeah, most of the snails in the area are probably going to be more GI issues. Um, you may be able to find a rare one here and there, more of a concern. The bufo toads, uh, fortunately, again, they're regional, so they're not yeah. really they're not commonly seen up in the north. So, yeah, you southerners, you get all that great Man. warm weather, but yeah. then you, all, you get all, all the bad things. Yeah. Too. So, Everything grows um, well, including yeah. toxins. <laughs> so your cane toads and bufo and uh, bufo toads definitely. We can yeah. see some logic signs. Can see some heart issues. A big problem there. Those can be yeah. hard to identify sometimes for a pet owner. You know, was this a bufo toad or was this a, a different type of toad? Was it a, just a frog? A lot of people yeah. will do. You know, mix them up and frogs are not really going to be an issue, but toads, uh, there's a lot of different poisonous toads that are out there. I yeah. think, I think toads probably got the same go as chocolate. It seemed down, down to a lot of the pet owners. Maybe I just surrounded myself with really smart, aware people. I know they already knew about these toads they already mm -hmm. knew that they were bad. And that's like they grew up in mm -hmm. their, their family told them, don't let your dogs get a hold of them. Where yeah. when I, when I went to school, I thought I had no idea. I thought it was weird that a toad yeah. would be, could be so toxic and so you know, devastating to a dog because a lab will go pick one up and just <laughs> chew on it forever, right? That's what they do. Yeah. What dogs do. But but down uh, down south, they seem to know about it. So they did. So you know, the community's gotten done a good job of getting the word out about those things. So that's yeah, good. but but not not always because I treated a lot of toad um, toxicities and the worst. Well, just because was... they know about it doesn't mean they can prevent the dog from going to get a toad. Well, but that, they knew to bring it in. True. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, they yeah. they didn't know that the dog had uh, eaten it, um, uh, or that that was the problem. They just it, or know... even the thing, right? They just said this no. isn't right. Yeah. Right, the dog was either having seizures. There was mm. one little Pekingese. Mm -mm. His his name was Cash. Um, he was a great dog, little Pekingese. Um, he uh he ate the toad, <laughs> what? which was bad. Super bad because then it just sits in the belly right. and continues to to provide toxin to the dog. Um, yeah, he he did great. Um, his owners brought him right in, um, and he was having seizures already. Actually, he'd been foamy, and so I guess he just got tired of how it tasted, so he just ate it. I don't, I don't that's really. That's what know I do. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. Let me have more of it. <laughs> but he wasn't a stupid dog. He was a he was like a very atypical Pekingese. I really enjoyed him. Um, Questionable. He says, well, I'm already committed. I've already yeah. started. Yeah. Might as well just finish it. I'm and, no quitter. <laughs> I know. And you know, and it's, it's like, like, you know him because he actually was a working dog. I mean, I've never seen a Pekingese who was a working dog, but he worked. He herded. Um, so Are anyway. you getting your dogs corrected? No. This one? You got a smart yes, Pekingese I mean, yes, and a working dog who ate a toad. Yes. Uh, give me a break. <laughs> yes. And uh, anyway, um, I so we treated him. He had the best owners. Uh, they were just like, we just love him. We You have to fix him. And uh, I actually had to put him in an induced coma and give him all kinds of massive amounts of supportive so, care because he ate the toad. Yeah. Like, was I his name Cash before or after the? It was before. <laughs> okay. All right. It was before. <laughs> anyway, after I think 24, 36 hours, I brought him up out of the coma Um and, uh, and I was able to bring him all the way up and he did fine. Right. The seizures had passed and, and he did great. And then he turned out to have a really great, like he was just a really cool dog. That's what, yeah. I mean, it's been 20 years since I saw him, I think at least 15. Um, but I still remember everything about him and his case because he was such Apparently. a cool dog. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we you have great so. toxin stories. I can really, you, right. You, I so love, good. I love this. Great. Yeah. Well, I did, um, I used to do a ton of emergency medicine and, uh, you know, I was what they call a magnet. Uh, so, <laughs> so well, if also, I was you, on the ship, you did emergency in it. the South, right? And I did. so there's a lot of talk like we've talked about. There's a lot of toxic mm -hmm. stuff in mm -hmm. the South. I don't know what's yeah. worse in the South because in the winter it's all kind of concentrated. And so, you don't have a lot to choose from, but in the South, it's, it's a lot. I don't know. I mean, then I had like a killer bee story. Well, I had a couple of killer bee stories that were great. Like if you ever want to worry about, um, those, like those Africanized killer bee things. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be worried that it's, it's real. It's true what they do. They swarm and then they just, yep. Mm -hmm. They're very aggressive. They are. And like one, like one story. Well, and they can anyway. sting several times. Anyways, it's not what we're talking they about. They can, but then the stinger is there and it just keeps pumping as long right. as the stinger is there. And um, well, I guess all bees do that. But um, one, this one dog, um, not at band camp, but this one dog uh -huh. was like, it was like a 60 or 70 pound um, pit mix. They took the little boy to the hospital 
and the police um, had arrived. There were 911 call, right? And so the ambulance took the kid to the hospital and the sheriff brought the dog to our emergency clinic. Oh, wow, um, that's a good sheriff. Yeah. No, it was, well, oh, yeah. yeah, they were, they were nice. They were nice guys, but they, I mean, they knew us at the emergency clinic. Um, yeah, that was it. That was a, that was not a great situation. That's why I'm saying those bees are real. Okay. I digress into bees, but we were talking about flowery plants and stuff. So that's okay. Well, kind of makes sense. Sort of, sort of. Yeah. Okay. So the number one thing, Dr. Renee, is there any one thing that you wish pet owners knew about safety in the yards, landscape areas, et cetera, just because of your experience with so many calls um, at the helpline? I think a couple of them. I'm going to digress a little bit too. One of okay. them is fertilizers. So fertilizers, mm -hmm. once they've gone Good out point. onto your yard, usually yeah. not a big issue. It takes a while for that, you know, even that dog that's a vacuum and is just, is just scouring your yard back and forth with uh, licking up that fertilizer. Once it's been put, once it's been put down, watered in, mm -hmm. kind of follow the directions, usually not going to be a big issue. And then the spot that I think fits, but kind of doesn't fit is just rodenticides. So baits. So, oh, wow. um, or even if you're using like mole, go mole and go for baits. Uh, those uh, usually contain zinc phosphide. That's a really common active ingredient. A lot of people don't put, um, bury that low enough. And again, our, our friend, the lab, those dogs who are really great sniffers, or maybe it's the basset or the hound dog that's a great sniffer and goes down in there and then ingests that. And they can have just a really small amount to be a big issue for them. Uh, there's also little mole and gopher worms, little gummy worms that I think are, uh, they frighten me having kids in the house. Yeah, they ah, look sure, like gummy sure. worms. That is but crazy. Those, yeah, those contain a pretty a much higher concentration of bromethylene. And bromethylene, oh you, can see, you can see that in mouse and rat baits, oh but a gosh. much lower concentration. Right. And so right. one gummy, one worm of these little guys can be problematic in that large breed dog. So, does it ugh. look like a gummy worm, like for real? I think does it, it does. look like an earthworm? If it looks like yeah. a gummy worm, this kid's going to eat it and that not tell mom and dad. It's going to, it's indiscriminately going to poison whatever eats it, right? So yeah, that it's is a little some bit scary darker. stuff. Yeah, it's a little bit oh. darker. Kind of looks sometimes. Um, if you, I don't know, any of you who are who fish with those worm lures, those. I was just uh, gonna say that it must look like a lure, like fake bait. It, it kind of, yeah, it kind of looks. Some a of those bit look like, like gummy worms. Have they you seen do. some of the stuff they All make? All sparkly for with the glitter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Anyways. Anyways. anyway, so um, and so those definitely I would I would avoid. But then yeah. a lot of times, you know, people may set bait out along their house, so rat and mouse yeah. bait. So. That's where we talk about cholecalciferol. Yeah. So that vi it's a vitamin D3, uh, very concentrated vitamin D3 uh, bait, and then yeah. bromethylene, and then what we consider the anticoagulants. There's a lot of different ac um, active ingredients there. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's something that a lot of times people think about, well, it's the winter time, you know, the mice and things are going to come up closer to the house. We're going to put that there. And then maybe they forget about it, or maybe they didn't really see the importance or value of putting it in those little bait stations and they lay the bait around on their own. Or, you know, they're trying to- Oh my God. Can you just imagine out. like those little green bars oh. or sticks of bait, the Tomcat yeah. bait, like just laying around. Let's just leave that laying around. That doesn't look anything like a pet toy or a kid toy or yeah. come on yeah. people, come on, right? Come <laughs> on. Holy None of our holy. listeners do that, but maybe our listeners' friends, right? Maybe so our listeners' friends. Get, get yeah. on to friends, right? Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know what? Spring for the little box. <laughs> like, don't go cheap. Spring for the little box. Yeah. yeah. And, and and certainly animals, they're not pet proof. They're yeah. they're certainly more resistant to it. And we get lots of calls with pets who have gotten into dogs, particularly who have gotten into those bait bo boxes, but it helps to deter them a little bit. And things that I would definitely suggest not having out and about in your anywhere in your yard or landscaping area. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes that's sense. a great thought about the fertilizer. I've forgotten about it that, is. and and I do worry about it. But I'm also more, like you said, once it's on a yard, it's okay. But you got to watch when it's not and it's sitting in your garage open. Like that's what you're yeah. trying to get to, right? The dogs will get into it and lick it up, and yes. they get all of it. Then right, there's no one there's taking a whole bunch of it, so that's not good. Yeah. Right. And, if, and if you have the garage that so many people do where um, you use that that box or that bag of plant food 
very infrequently and it yeah. lasts you for 15, 20 years, throw it out. <laughs> you got to save that book, man. <laughs> throw it out and get some new ones. There's some of those, you know, that are out there that yeah. like there was a, a rose plant food that used to contain an organophosphate, which can cause yeah. neurologic problems. Oh and God. they've, you know, that's not something that's there anymore, but you it know, could I, be. It could, it could be. It, yeah, it's it great for the plants. Yeah, it could <laughs> really still be the in plants. the in the garage. So I always say, I oh mean, gosh, if you've had it for five years or so, let's toss it out. Yeah, and see what, maybe, maybe there's some newer ingredients and. Um, let's let's, let's toss it out by not putting it in the trash though let's toss it out yeah. by taking it to some disposal place because <laughs> i mean organophosphate that's also like a category of nerve agent yeah. so yeah. We, we don't really want to be like spreading that far and wide so yeah. yeah okay this is awesome but the number one thing for everyone who's listening to realize is that if you think your pet got into any of these or anything else you think um in your yard or your neighbor's yard or even surrounding a dog park because landscapers don't always know um just take them to your veterinarian take them to the vet be ready to answer the questions if you see for sure that they chewed on a plant you can't identify take a picture take it with you <laughs> i mean for heaven's sakes we have the technology now and um uh, you can also, if you're worried and your vet's closed, or if you're worried and you just, you're, you're not sure you can get in, call the pet, pet poison helpline, right? Talk yeah. to or you're out of town it. and it's just easier to call. There's a lot, there's a lot of options here. So yeah, yeah. yeah you got it. And maybe we save you a trip to the vet. Maybe right. we save you a trip in and save you the stress for, for having to take uh, Cosette yeah. into the veterinarian. Yes. There's, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, and that's the thing is that's always a question and don't worry, <laughs> friends, we have an upcoming episode, um, this year that's going to talk about, can we skip the trip? Um, how, what are like key things we should look for? Are we panicking? Um, Hey, don't make that decision all by yourself. There's help. There's help out there. The pet poison helpline is a, is a great resource. Um, so call Dr. Renee and her colleagues and, and they can help you out. Uh, remember because... big bomb diggity. Get a right. direct line right. to Dr. Renee. Ask for her. No. <laughs> anyway, but she is there and they they are looking to help you and your pet have uh have a happy outcome. Um, yeah. you know. So Can you all imagine right. that caller. Oh, I forgot it's, her name, but she goes by the big bomb big diggity. Bomb Can I talk to her, please? You, that would be great. You know, I think I can safely say that every person that's going to answer that phone is that, a big bomb. That's diggity. me. That's oh, me. Yeah, they, are all, yeah, that's they, are, they are all yeah. so, um, it's, it, we, we just have a great, a great group of people who are very, very knowledgeable, way more than me. And that are just, uh, they're there to help, to help your pets. You know so. what that is, Dr. Jin? That is a captain of a team right that's there. That's right that there. Is excellent. That all is right. incredible leadership right there. Okay. It, it's honesty. Oh. It's so it's complete mm. honesty for sure. I was sure. just going to say it is helpful when that's the truth, right? So that's yeah. awesome. It's that's easy awesome. to say. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dr. Renee Schmidt with the Pet Poison Helpline and Safety Call International, thank you so much for joining us today to talk all about toxins that might be in our own yard right. um, and and just other, other safety issues with pets. We appreciate you so much. You bet. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that's all we have. Um, I'm going to go check out uh, some... I got to go check the yard. Suspicious plants at the farm. <laughs> I'm That's actually right. going to go to the garage and throw out my 15-year-old plant for a leisure. I'm, Please I'm do that. I'm 100% that's me. So. Yes, that is you. All right. Well, hey, we're going to go clean up, and I'm Dr. Jen the vet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And we'll catch you all on the next episode. This episode is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements, the leader in digestive health for dogs, cats, and horses. National Animal Care Certification Council, or... PAC brings independent testing and certification to the pet care services industry. Is your dog's daycare or boarding kennel or a groomer manned by PAC certified professionals? Don't know? If you don't know, you gotta ask. Look for the PAC emblem at your facility to make sure that your pet's receiving the highest level of professional pet care. Because we all know it's safer in a pack. Your PAC CE code for this episode is CC220075.